Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Richard Volsick. I am president of the American Chamber of Commerce here in Hong Kong. And it's a very great pleasure to enter, uh, welcome you here today and look forward to another muscular panel, I guess is a way to phrase it, with uh, very knowledgeable people talking about important topics. Um, uh, you have the saddle on your, on your, uh, in front of you already. Uh, please feel free to be uh, again eating. I just got a few opening comments, announcements to make. Uh, we at, at AmCham uh, take your time very seriously, so we start on time, end on time, and if we're still eating, we ch AmChamers, the guys with the blue tags, can tell you we are very adept at listening with our mouths full, so <laughs> not to worry. Um, I do want to say if, if you've got mobile devices of any sort that make noise or could, please put them on silent or turn them off. Uh, so when we begin our panel discussion today, uh, it will not be interrupted. Uh, if you look around the room, you do see a lot of people with uh, blue name tags or red. Red is a member of the board. Yellow is a member, is one of our 60-odd uh, committee, ch committee chairs or vice chairs. And uh, the gray tags are for people who are guests or non-members. Uh, we've got um, plenty of people, including Michael Tsung, he can raise it, he's raising his hand in the back, who's our director of membership. If you would like to be more information about joining the chamber, talk to him, give him, your, give him your card. If your company is already a member and you want to be added on as an additional member, he can also assist with that. Um, our program today will begin around 1.05, uh, but first I would like to take an opportunity to introduce people at our head table so that either during the lunch or afterwards, not during the speeches obviously, uh, you have a chance to introduce yourselves. Uh, so first of all, Dr. Henry Chen, uh, who will be one of our, uh, for head of research for Asia Pacific at CBRE, will be one of our speakers, be introduced at length a little later. Welcome. Next to him, uh, Beth Smits, who is our AmCham Financial Services Committee Chair, Head of Public Affairs and Communications, Asia Pacific for SWIFT. So Beth's here. Uh, next is a Deputy Chairman and Chief Executive Officer for Heisen Development Company, uh, Siu Chen Lao. Very happy to have you here. Uh, next to him is Head of Asia Sales for Jefferies Hong Kong, uh, Bruce Ingram. Uh, next to him, uh, uh, Adriel Chan, Executive Assistant to the Ma uh, Managing Director of Hong Lung Properties. Welcome. And then another committee chair uh, from Real Estate Committee, uh, account Director for CBRE, Charles Kelly. And then, of course, another one of our speakers uh, from Regional Head for Financial Services, KPMG, Simon Gleave. So you'll see some of these in action very soon. Our two committee chairs, Beth and, uh, and Charles, uh, are always open for uh, follow-up emails on these kinds of things. If you're interested to see what both either the Finance Committee or actually any committee as well as real estate does, go to our website homepage, click on committees, and then click on the various committees and you'll see a whole list of the events that we have given over the last two years and get an idea of the kinds of things we do. And also we urge you to look for things that we're not doing that we should, so you can tell us. We're always open to suggestions. Um, again, enjoy another great lunch here at the Conrad. And I want to give special thanks and welcome to our guest tables from Jefferies and CBRE. It's great to have you here. And uh, we'll look forward to a very nice luncheon, followed by some real insights on both financial and real estate issues. Again, thank you for coming and welcome. Just wanted to uh, say thanks uh, to everyone for attending today, um, and a special thanks to Richard and the, the AmCham uh, committee or event committee for setting this up. Uh, and, and I'm here to introduce our speakers. Now, I, I know um, while there's currently quite a bit of focus on Brazil at the moment with the, the World Cup finishing and the uh, uh, BRICS summit uh, commencing, um, very much appreciate uh, everyone's willingness and, and hopefully eagerness at um, shifting your attention back, back to China for a bit. Um, and if any of you were or are an avid uh, football fan and were I guess uh, eager enough to, to watch the game this morning, please feel free to ask for a second cup of coffee. Um, don't, don't want you to, to miss what our uh, very experienced uh, speakers have to say today. Uh, my name is Charles Kelly. Uh, I am the chair of the Real Estate, uh, Real Estate Committee for the AmCham. Um, 
if you're at all interested in our events or what the real estate committee does, please feel free to contact me or the event staff uh, and they'll put you in touch. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, both of our speakers, uh, Mr. Simon Gleave and Dr. Henry Chin. Uh, guys, come on up and have a seat. Um, so I'm after you, yeah. Um, Simon is, uh, will be setting the scene for our discussion today by uh, introducing uh, the, our topic and the implications uh, with regards to the financial and wealth management uh, perspective on shadow banking. Uh, Simon is the regional head of KPMG's financial services division in Asia Pacific. Uh, to provide, provide a bit more background about Simon, other than the fact that I found out he's, he's a, a keen cyclist and, and world traveler, uh, he has worked in Beijing since 2001 and has been involved in several landmark IPOs, namely uh, the China Construction Bank, uh, China Citic Bank, and most notably, or most recently, uh, the China Everbright Bank IPO. Uh, he's also involved in the restructuring of banks across Europe and Asia and is currently the global lead partner for the audit of ICBC in China. Uh, and he also acts as the lead partner for a number of Chinese clients listed on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Uh, there's quite a bit more about Simon, but in some, he's very well placed to talk on our topic today. Um, I'd also like to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Henry Chin. Um, for today's session, Henry will pick up where Simon leaves off and uh, discuss the impacts of shadow banking on the real estate environment in China. Uh, based in Hong Kong, Henry leads uh, research for CBRE across Asia Pacific. Uh, prior to joining CBRE, Henry was the head of APAC research for Primerica Real Estate Investors. And before that, um, before his time with Primerica, he was with, um, I guess, several different roles for, for Deutsche Bank. Uh, Henry is very active in the community and education. Um, a few examples of this include uh, he's an assistant professor at National Taipei University, a guest lecturer at Oxford Brookes University, a guest speaker at Hong Kong University, and a chairman of ANREV's uh, research committee. So that's a quick um, snapshot of our speakers. The format uh, for today's discussion will be um, getting views from Simon first, uh, which will be shortly followed by Henry, uh, and then we'll close out with uh, hopefully a very uh, active discussion or Q&A session, which will be led by Beth Smits, uh, who chairs our Financial Services Committee. So I'd please ask uh, for everyone to uh, save your questions for the end. And now, uh, over to Simon. Simon. Okay. Um, look, it's a real pleasure to be here. It's, uh, it's a lot cooler here than Beijing today. Um, it was 43 degrees uh, last week, so um, in case you're feeling hot, come and visit. Um, the, the, uh, I'm going to do a really quick romp through the credit markets this year and what's happening. And we've got 15 minutes each, but please ask any questions you have about what's going on. Um, <coughs> just, to, just to make it clear, China's in a very s big transition at the moment between different types of uh, financing the economy. When I went there, about 95% of all new financing in China was through the banks back in 2000. Um, and that has changed, and recently we're into this phase now of uh, banks and alternative credit markets being developed and financing the economy. And if you look at it, about 50% of new capital formation in China now is from non-bank sources. So this is an enormous <coughs> change in just uh, 15 years. Um, the future, which is what all the reforms are about, and which I'm sure I'll be talking to you guys in the future about, is about the development of real credit markets, um, market pricing of, of interest rates, market pricing of the capital markets, and so forth. So we're in a, in, in a great transition. Um, it is actually really quite vital we get it right because you can't finance a consumer market economy using government-directed financing. You have to have market financing to be efficient in capital. So there's a lot of conversations I have with economists about the inefficiencies of capital allocation in China, and that is a symptom of where we are today. So this is the big question the government's got to get through, is how do we finance our economy efficiently? Um, we have some very high debt ratios, so our return on investment at the moment is regarded as being um, very inefficient. So that, that's roughly where we are. Um, <coughs> now, you can see very clearly, if you look at what we call total social financing, now just to emphasize, this is a China-specific number. This does not exist in normal economies. Um, it, the Chinese invented it. It's a way of trying to assess total financing in the economy. Not that long ago, by the way. But you can easily see, if you go with the left side, um, 2002, the red is bank lending. And you can see financing of all the growth in the economy is from the banks. And they're state-owned. 
So this is government-directed financing. And bear in mind that the banks are still state-owned, and most of that lending is still concentrated towards the state institutions, the state companies. So the private sector in China, which is estimated at about half the economy now, um, struggles to get financing from the banks. And still does, by the way. I mean, it still struggles to get it. There are targets for the banks to actually lend to, to small companies, but essentially they're still pushing the money out to the, the state companies. But on the right, where we are today, you can see a very different mixture of, of where financing is coming <coughs> from. So this is, this is, you can see it in the numbers where it's come from. And if you look at the latest numbers, this is this year's numbers out of the PBOC. You can see the new, fi this is new financing. It's not total financing, it's new financing this year. So in, in the first quarter, you can see where the new financing came from. <coughs> and most of it is still coming from, from bank lending, but we've got a lot coming from entrusted loans, from trust loans, corporate bonds, and so forth. So there's now a range of financing available, and it's growing and changing. Um, the key issue to me is the speed of change is possibly faster than the speed of risk management. And I have a great concern about the fact that bank lending is now transparent. We have bank accounts. Most of the banks, uh, the big banks anyway, are listed in Hong Kong as well. Um, we produce international financial information. We've got all the disclosures on MPLs. The rest of the sector, there is no disclosure of MPLs. You have no idea of the credit quality of shadow banking. And I think that is the fundamental problem we face in understanding this market. So failures you only see in the Chinese newspapers when somebody's complained, the government's getting upset. And um, we had a, a case, we've had two cases in Shaanxi province this year. One involved ICBC, one didn't. Um, you only get anecdotes. There is no statistics. So if you are going to a, a trust company and you're buying a wealth management product, you don't know what, how they perform. You don't know if this is a good trust company. You don't get the data. Um, so overall, now, half of the financing the economy is coming in the shadow world with shadow information. That, that's the danger. So we don't know if risk is being managed or not. And um, that causes a lot of conspiracies and conspiracy theories. Um, I don't discount all of them, by the way, because I do see that there's a lot of risk. Um, some of them are quite extreme. Some people say, you know, China's just full of bad debts. That's not true. On the other hand, I can't prove it. So there's a problem. Um, <clears throat> but uh, just put a few things in perspective. Um, this shows you some of the, the world's major economies. Formal banking's in dark blue, shadow banking in light blue. Um, and you can see China doesn't have a particularly big shadow banking sector compared to even global advanced economies. The UK is the most crazy economy when it comes to banking. Um, London is just a big financial center. Um, most of that financing isn't used in the UK, so it, it's, it's pan-European and pan-global. But it shows you that well, I don't think overall as a macro economy, we're in a danger zone. On the other hand, we're trying to get there really fast. So if we don't fix the transparency, we don't fix the risk management now, there's a lot of danger coming down the line. So, so that, that's the issue, I think. But also, this is a percentage of the total credit system. The trouble is China's credit system is significantly bigger than the UK's. So the bank I'm dealing with, which you'll see the results from at the end of August, they have over three trillion US dollars of assets now. That puts them up number one in the world by assets. <coughs> so Chinese banks have hit a point, they're now the biggest institutions on the planet, and they're growing very fast. So the growth rates this year in the big banks are about five to eight percent. European banks are shrinking, American banks are growing one or two percent. Chinese institutions are gonna take over the world if they keep this up. So it's, we're in a very interesting and transition and you begin to see what's happening. So a few warnings for the half year, in case any of you guys are bank analysts. Um, profit growth remains relatively high, but we're seeing, I see troubling signs of increasing MPLs. And in particular, if you look carefully into the accounts, you need to look at MPL formation. Uh, the banks are writing off a lot of MPLs this year to keep the ratios down. So if you look through the accounts in detail, you'll see it's all about MPL formation this year, and particularly overdues. You'll see very large increases in overdues of, of lending this year. So we're into a troubling overall, um, I would say, loan credit environment. On top of that, suddenly we have lots of shadow banks as well. So it is uh, at the highest level of risk I've seen in 15 years in China, um, and so it was interesting to see how it develops over the next few years. The one thing that's good about the banks, though, is that capital ratios remain very strong. The regulator keeps them high. 
Shadow banks don't have the same sort of capital. Trust companies have very little capital. Um, so there's nothing behind those products. All the risk sits with the economy and the individuals. So there's, there's no buffer. Okay, so bear that in mind as well. So if a trust product fails, your chances of recovery are pretty limited. Um, so it's interesting to me to see that, you know, generally speaking, the return on trust products is a lot higher than your bank deposits, a lot higher than your time deposits in the bank. And yet the failure rate that we can see anecdotally is very low. I think about five products have failed this year. There are thousands of failing loans. So something is keeping this sector afloat in a way, maybe Henry's going to explain what he thinks, but something is keeping it afloat, and I suspect it's government liquidity. So I think we're seeing artificially low levels of failure um, to keep confidence up, to try and ensure that people keep investing. So we're in a very dangerous situation, and the government's running a, 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 a bit of a tightrope over this year to try and get this right. Um, but just think, that, and people say to me, why are they doing it? It's easy. If we want the economy to grow 7.5%, we need to create financing for that. And about half that financing is currently coming from the shadow banking sector. If we lose confidence in that sector, how are we going to finance the economy? And so therefore, if we have a crash in financing, the private sector in particular will have a crash, and that's bad for economic growth. So they've got to keep confidence up. But then it's the dangerous game to play. Um, a couple of numbers for you for the banks, just to show you what's happening. Um, in the first quarter, the listed banks, 13 out of 16 had increasing NPLs. The other three had flat NPLs. Okay, and that's managed ratios, because they wrote off a lot of bad debts. Um, total loans increased, but provision coverages, provision to loan ratios have, have decreased a bit. So you're beginning to see some stresses appearing in the banking sector. Um, but we don't have similar data overall for the, the shadow banking sector. So my assumption is it should be the same or worse, um, because it's high risk. <coughs> Um, just to clarify a couple of things, um, the banks issue a lot of alternative financial products. Um, now, wealth management products in the banks are included in shadow banking. Uh, they're not on the bank's balance sheets. These are off balance sheet. Um, they are all new assets originated by the bank and, and purchased by customers. So the only time they get onto the balance sheet of the bank is if in the, the repurchase cycle of them, um, they don't resell them. So. Of these sort of 14 trillion or so, now that's a pretty big number, uh, around about 2 trillion sit on the balance sheets of the banks because the banks have had to purchase them back because of maturity. And they hold liquidity and provisions to do that. But about 12 trillion sits off balance sheet. And that 12 trillion, you do not see the failure. So you don't see this disclosed in the bank's NPLs. They disclose the total. Some banks disclose the total. Um, others don't. And now this morning you would have seen in the paper that the CBRC is putting in place much stricter rules about how the banks manage these assets. But that's a very big number. And it's been created only in about five years. So it's a huge new market. Um, when you look at the alternative financial sector, shadow banking is a kind of broad term. These are the principal things in China at the moment. And I'm leaving it up to Henry to talk about. But I want to talk about the two at the bottom, which are relatively new, the fintech funds and the P2P lending. Um, just before that, there's a lot of regulation on shadow banking. Um, it's constantly coming out. Um, so this is what, until this morning, because there's another one to slot in now for this morning as well. Um, but you can see, th so the regulator is constantly looking at this sector, trying to bring standards up. Um, so there's constant new stuff coming out. So I get asked a lot of questions about this, um, what they all relate to, but basically it's improving risk management, it's trying to improve say, the selling process to, to customers and so forth. Um, but the regulator is scrambling in my mind to catch up with what's happening in the market. Okay, fintech funds, I just want to talk briefly. I have never seen a financial product grow this fast. So um, it's 541 billion <coughs> RMB over two years or 18 months roughly. Zero to that in 18 months. Now, just to clarify, this is not really shadow banking because what's actually happening here is the funds that are coming out of people's bank deposits on their smartphones, you can put in like 2,000 RMB a day. Um, so if, you, if you're very quick, you can get a lot of these, but it, I'm, I'm not good at that. Um, but the, the fund is reinvested back into banks. 
So all this is actually doing is improving the yield to the depositor. So it goes back into wholesale funding. So this isn't really financing the real economy. It's just a means of taking the yield away from the banks and giving it to the customers, which is why the big banks really do not like this. And if you mention it to the chairman of ICBC, he tends to go a bit red um, because they're losing money over it. So the customer's just getting enhanced yield. Um, then the, the P2P platforms. Now, this is amazing. There's 350 already in existence. And I was with the, uh, the guy who set up Credit Ease uh, last month talking about it. Um, and so the range of transactions, the type of products is amazing, very, very fast. So this is what happens when you can use the internet and replicate what they've done in the States and replicate what they've done elsewhere. And if you think you have no information about wealth management products, you have none about this. Okay? Just trying to find any information about this is impossible. Um, I don't believe that the total is that at all. I, I mean, this is just guesses we're getting from, from people analyzing and, and guessing. So um, I think this will start being regulated very quickly, although it is all private lending in theory. But it's great. It is growing very fast, and it's kind of out of control. If we've got 350 platforms, I mean, we've only got just over 100 banks in China. So, so you know, you can see the speed of change. Um, but if you look at the bottom one, it's uh, Ping An Group, which is a financial insurance banking asset management group. So they're they're actually trying to sort of use this platform. They're the first of the big institutions to try and use it, um, and actually, it's being pretty successful. Uh, as a way it means it. So I think you'll see a lot more of this in the next few years as well. So rapidly changing environment um, and unknown risks. So with that, I'll pass over to Henry. Thanks, Simon, and good afternoon, everyone. And uh, my name is Henry, and uh, Henry Ching. And uh, I'm here to talk about you know, the implication for real estate markets. If you haven't seen this report, I encourage you to go to our website to download the paper. You know, I'm going to just go through our findings in the next 15, 20 minutes. And then you know, if there's some question I can't answer, my colleague Ada Cho is here. She's the mastermind for, the, for this project. <laughs> Thanks, Ada. And uh, so, so people want to know about China shadow banking. So the next 15 minutes, I'm going to talk about what is shadow banking, why it has been grow so much over the past few years, and what's the implication for real estate market. To start with, we always ask the client, uh, client asks us, how big is the debt market in China? No one seems to know the, the, the absolute number. Here we can see the total estimate size for the US dollar turns is around 23 trillion is around 140 trillion RMB, which including the public market and the private market. So you can see the public market is around 30 trillion, uh, it's around 27 trillion RMB. And for the private market side, it's about 110 trillion RMBs. So in China, it basically split up. It's 30% or less in the public market, 70% or more on the private market. In any mature market, <coughs> the split should be around 45, 55, or 50, 50. So let's want to tell you how underdeveloped for Chinese public debt markets are. So what is shadow banking? You know, so many different terms about shadow banking. You know, what we define here is anything related to the loans is not from, from the bank in a private market. It's called shadow banking. So there are three major components in the shadow banking system in China. Number one is trust product. Number two is a wealth management product. And number three is underground uh, private lendings. So I'm going to go through each of them briefly. What is a tr uh, trust product? How big are they? They're around 11 trillion RMBs. Now, what the trust product means, you can syndicate a loan to issue the trust. It could be one trust holder, uni holder, up to 200. So it'd be one to 200. Around 70% of the trust product are the one uni holders. Why is that? Because they want to package 
so-called loss trust product into the wealth management product. So you can see the wealth management product is around 10 trillion, which is 7 trillion are coming from the trust product alone. Yeah. I want, also want to mention about trust investment product. It's actually regulated under trust laws, as well as supervised by CBRC. However, the, the, the wealth management product, we haven't got a very clear, probably Simon could correct me if I'm wrong, we haven't got a very clear guidance on that, that who is actually overseeing the wealth management product here. So you can see it's around 10 trillion, which is sell to the retail investors. A final part is underground lendings. No one actually knows how big they are. That's a problem. So, you know, the source, you know, we think that we saw the various estimate is around 60 trillion, 16 trillion RMBs here. So that gives you some parameters of what is the shadow banking, who are they, and what they are. This chart just will show you the growth of the, the, the trust product over the past six, seven years. You can see the mutual fund hasn't got any growth over the past six years. So why is that? Because most of the mutual funds are investing in domestic companies, domestic things, they can't go offshore. So that's why we haven't seen the growth in the mutual fund industry. But you can see that insurance had a good run for the last six, you know, seven years. But the strongest growth is not coming from the insurance, AUM. It's actually coming from the trust product. You can see from 2007, it's only around one trillion RMB for AUM. You can see now 2013, by the end of last year, is 11 trillion. So within the seven years, the AU has been increased 10 times, and even you know, bigger than the insurance AUN. So that's a staggering growth over the past six years. So now I want to move on to why a shadow banking has grown so much, so fast over the past six years. To start with, why? There's a three reasons here I want to tell you why. Number one, we are trying to fill the gap for traditional bank lending industries. You know, Chinese bank lending is very, very regulated by the government. You know, they follow by government's policies and sentiments there. As a result, we can see domestic banks are extremely reluctant to lend to small, medium enterprises. And all those Chinese banks, I think, in the, in the past, it's a lack of a comprehensive credit system. They got a poor underwrite, underwriting process. As a result, causes so many problems. So small, medium enterprises, they can't get the money from the bank. They have to go to the shadow banking system to get their loans. Number two, it's a, it's a capital market. It's relatively immature. You know, the size of a corporate bonds in China is only around 16% of the China GDP. Give you references, for the US market, very mature, it's around 60% of the US GDP. So that tells you it's a lot of room to grow for, for China. And also, there's a rules in the China corporate loans is you cannot issue the corporate coupon higher than 40% of the base rate. So they got a cap there. That's a result, no, no much incentive for them to issue this. And for the IPO market, you can see over the past 20 years, the government has stopped IPO activities eight times, eight times. That, that just tell you it's crazy, you know, for the, any freedom economies, we don't see that. So that's why it's relatively immature capital market. The third thing is excess liquidities. You know, get so much liquidity in, around the system. Money supply is ahead of market fund, uh, uh, fundamental GDP growth. No much, no much investment product for those retail investors. As a result, they need to find some alternative products to give you the higher returns. This chart just want to share with you what the money supply versus the GDP growth. You can see over the past 14 years, you know, GDP growth is around 9.8%. But the M2, border definition of a money supply, is around 18% per annum. So nearly double, nearly double. So that tells you so much liquidity in the system. As a result, the investors need to find higher returns for their money. They need to find the better return to inflation hedge. Don't forget the Chinese. Uh, inflation traditionally has been very high, only recently got a 3 to 4 percent, but in the past got to 6 to 7 percent. So they need to have a higher returns to the hedge, the money, inflation. So you can see here I want to share with you is average return for 2013. 
if you invested into the stock market in Shanghai last year, you actually make, ne make negative 6.7% of returns. Not attractive. If you go to the deposit or buying the, you know, a government bond up to five years deposit, you only get a return for 4.8. If you got a one year, three months, six months deposit, you get less than 3% of return interest rate. As a result, it's not very attractive. That's why the investors are going to the trust product, which offered you last year 7% of returns. But what about the lenders? You know, lenders are also very happy to produce this, such a product because they've got a high margin for them. You can see from the you know, left-hand side, you can see loans to SMEs, loans to small media enterprises. The loan originators, they can charge meetings or even above to the small media enterprises. And then funny things, we saw some interest rate they charge you for 30 or 40 percent. Meetings is a minimum. It's normally it's a lot significantly higher than meetings. So once they originated the loans, they're going to give the trust companies to, 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 to have independent trust contract. As I say, from one unit to 200 unit holders. But they charge the interest rate around 10%. So you can see that upper charge between 15 and 10 or 5%. So once, like a one unit holder for the trust product, they distribute through the bank, become a wealth management product. You can see the return for the trust holder is 7%. So you can see another upper charge of about for 3%. So that's become very attractive for, for lots of financial holdings, financial companies, you know, long, uh, long originators to create this kind of product because they've got high margins. And also, the end users are very happy about it because I got a 7% returns for my money. As a result, you know, this is a capital stack, capital structure for lots of Chinese small media enterprises or, or all the developers are changing. So you can see on the left hand side chart shows you the Chinese developers is a traditional capital stack. We got the IPOs, we got a pre seed for the pre sales, and they also had the bank lendings. That's a traditional ways to, you know, the structure for the capital stack. But now we had the problems. IPO activity has to stop it. And then also had a slowdown in the, in the pre-sale activities. And the bank are not lending. So you can see that's a current capital stack is. So, you know, we got like, you can see that, I can't walk there, you can see the, the lighter grayish buys kind of junior loans. That's where shadow banking comes in. And then for the bigger developers, you know, they don't feel the pain because actually they can assess the senior loans from the you know, bank lendings you know, Chinese banks still lend, but lend to the big developers. They also tap into the offshore bond market, such as in Hong Kong, they issue the corporate bonds. Uh, just to give you some example of Suiyang, you know, we look at the Suiyang, I hope there's no audience here in this one, Suiyang, and I just saw the, the corporate coupon rate, they issue 200 million in February this year, the coupon was 6.8%. Last month, they also issue another 200 million tranche of a coupon, uh, coupon for corporate. They, they pay 9.8%. So you can see within four months, from 6.8 to 9.8, they increase by 3%. That just shows you how much money those developers are want. And for the equity market, we also see some developers, they are actually you know, find the JV partners from the private equity spaces here as well. So actually the capital stack has changed Especially, you know, when the pre-sale activity has to slowing down, it will really hurt those developers. And then the bottom chart I want to share with you is just the, the, the inventory turnover time from last year and to Q1 this year. So you can see last year in average, it took 10 months for developer to digest all those inventories. But till end of Q1 this year, it took 13 months to clear the inventories. So basically it has been increased by around 33%. If you look at, you look at Beijing as an example, you can see in the past, only take six months to clear the stocks. But now it took 12 months to clear stock. It's double, which increasing, you know, which doesn't mean that for the, the developed margin is around you know, 100 to 200%. And then the, the above the arrow shows you the traditional the construction activity will take five years to finish the construction activities. But lots of trust product, they only offer you 
two to three years. So there's a mismatching by the construction cycle and then the trust loans. So those two years, what two to three years of gap is funded by the pre-sale activities. So as a result, at this point of time, there's a pre-sale has been slowing down, there's no bank lendings, that's why they feel the pain. Are there any defaults in the past? We all know about it. You know, there were defaults this year in 2014. You can see the last two dots. In March 2014, we saw some Zhejiang developer default. And May 2014, and Shenzhen developer default. But those two default size are relatively small, you know, 1.5 billion, 3.5 billion. But you can see in March 2014, for Xinren real estate, you can see they pay the private loan 18 to 36%. That's, that's the scary numbers here. And then, but one of the problems for those two developer uh, when default is the mismatch for the product. So what they built, they built a luxury villa in lots of small you know, villages. So that's a mismatch for the product. Of course, they're going to have an increasing risk of default and they defaulted as well. And then you can see in 1999, the most famous case is the Guangdong uh, GTIC. It's a government back uh, companies that went for default uh, because they got so many development projects, they just can't deliver. And you can see they, they had nearly 40 billions of debt, but they only had the 20 billions of asset there. Because of that, so in 2001, Chinese government actually implemented uh, the various measures to clear the trust sectors. So you can see during that period, two years period, you can see the trust sector was up for 26, 200, 200 trust sectors down to 60. So you can see, you know, have, going through a lot of bankruptcies, a lot of consolidation periods during the period of time. Also the trusted law, as well as the, the four AMC companies has been formed during the period of time. So those are four AMC companies, one of them are very, you know, four of them are very successful, even one of them are listed in Hong Kong. So they do have the, you know, the AMC company to deal with those MPLs in China. So what CBRE believe for China residential market, real estate market? This chart I just want to share with you, you know, you know, various growth, ver various growth in a various parameters. You can see average wage growth and the GDP per capita and the disposable income for urban areas. The growth ratio is well above 10%. It's well above 10%. But you see the red line here, it shows you the national-wide residential selling price growth from 1995 to 2013 is around 7.8%. As a result, we do believe, and there's a still a room to grow in the long, longer terms. However, we do have a bumpy road in the short term here as well. Unlike the, the Americans, unlike the European peers, the gearing ratio for Chinese are tend to be very low. So you can see from 1998 until now, the average is around 32% for gearing ratios. At this point of time, our gearing ratio is 23%. So the Chinese housing price can afford some drop, some consolidation some, you know, in, a, in a short time because our gearing ratio is relatively low. For Chinese, you go to, in China, you want to go to residential markets. Number one issue you should pay attention to is the policies. And we believe a policy plays an important part. And especially for the Chinese government, they are trying to encourage the first home buyers. So they are creating the liquidity for the end users, real end users, not for the you know, speculative activities, you know, that, that kind of investors. So you can see, you know, they encourage the bank to lend the money. They also you know, release the liquidity by reducing the required reserve ratio to the bank to do that. However, for example, in Shanghai, in Beijing, the government also trying to restrict the hukou. So they don't give you the hukou. You can't buy the property because those two cities' property prices are too high. They try to cool it down. They try to cut the demand there. So there's a very positive and negative policy to influence the residential market. So that's what we said. When you go to the market, the end product is very important. You also need to understand the domestic policies there. So what CBRE thinks here is to summarize what we think. You know, actually, the China shadow banking, the size isn't a problem. The problem, there's two problems there. Number one, 
is under you know there's no many recollected activities there no one knows how big they are number two is a gross ratio you can see there's a 42 percent just give you an example the you know, 2012 the trusty product has been increased by 42 percent in one year and that global average is around eight percent that just tells you how much growth in a year so that is the problem so what's the concern for real estate market is, we do believe some small, medium developers, they are going to facing increasing risk of being default. And there are more bankruptcies to come. For larger developers, they're relatively safe because they still can tap into the offshore bond market to rate, you know, even they pay higher cost, but they still can tap into the, the offshore crypto bond market, as well as they can get the loans from the bank because they are larger developers, they have SOE background for that. But we also believe the Chinese government is unlikely to allow the market-wide collapse. Those two developers went bankrupt is because the mismatching for the product. You're building a luxury villa in the third tier, fourth tier cities. Of course, you're going to facing risk of default. The government is not going to rescue you for that. As a result, for the investors, we think about this, there's so many opportunities for the lenders and for the, uh, for the investors. You can see foreign lenders, we can see some, you know, some provide some ring cost loans for those overseas listed developers, that meaning many overseas listed developers, not for the private developers in, in China. And larger developers, I think we, they should prepare for the refinancing. We also believe for some of the larger developers, they can play the white night to save lots of smaller developers. So we are going to see some consolidation going forward over the next 18 to 24 months. For the private equity investment funds, we also see a lot of structured debt opportunities there, which is sometimes anecdotally, I can tell you, they charge 20% mezzanine loan within the three to four years for the very sound developers. Final, final slide we want to share with you for CBI research. You know, since I joined CBI research you know, five months ago, we start producing a lot of thematic Y special reports. You can see last week we will produce you know, the insurance paper, that's a significant outbound in, you know, in outflow for the insurance paper. We've done so many investment piece and occupy piece. I encourage you to go to our website to take a look. Some of them are very interesting. Thank you so much for, for the time. Thanks. Terrific. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, good to have both perspectives here from um, and, and look at the industry itself in um, the real estate impacts. Um, I've got questions, but it's your turn to ask questions. Um, so I'm going to open up the floor. The rules here are that we ask that you do identify yourself and your organization. Um, it allows us to try and anticipate your hidden agendas and also speak more directly <laughs> to um, what it is um, that you might be interested in. Any initial questions? Yes. I'm Alex from Prudential Real Estate Investors, Primerica. And um, this question's for Henry. Um, uh, of the three and a half to th uh, five trillion, I think, of all the trust products out there, and uh, how, much, how much of that is lent actually to the real estate sector? Do we have a breakdown of that? Uh, it's around 10%. Around 10%, yeah, around 10 okay. 10% real estate. Okay. Yes. And, Oh. You finish? Yes. Oh. <laughs> Hi, uh, David Wong with uh, UBS Global Real Estate. Uh, regarding the trust product, uh, is it right in 2013 there were new regulatory uh, rules that came out where the trust companies, uh, the shareholder of the trust companies are personally liable for all the products that they issue? So in the case of default, that they will be uh, 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 recourse to their uh, personal wealth and company balance sheet? <clears throat> Only in cases of fraud. Um, so um, it's very clear that trust products, the risk sits with the trust investors. Um, but in case of where the um, institution has missold, then um, other actions can be taken. So um, <clears throat> I'm not aware of anybody identifying any missold trust products yet. Um, a lot of the rules that have come out from CBRC are around the selling process, trying to improve the underwriting and selling process. Right. 
Um, but it, it's, it's certainly the case that to date, they, and they're emphasizing very strongly, all wealth management products, both trust and bank, the risk sits with the investors. And you only have recourse in the case of fraud or mis-selling, and that's it. Right. Um, but on the other hand, we don't see many collapses yet. Um, and the ones that have collapsed, by the way, are generally not property. It's more um, things like mining assets um, and, and such yep. like. So um, not quite clear to me. Um, we haven't actually seen a full recourse process because every time I've seen a failure of trust product, they seem to be bailed out by somebody. So um, never quite sure exactly what's happening. Yeah, well, that was my understanding of the trust product where even though the rules and regulations says the, the ultimate risk lies with the individual buyers, right? But then, but in practice, well, there's in, always yeah. a backstop, you know, to... to so far, that, that so far it, it is, but it isn't coming from the shareholders or the trust companies. It's well, being, it's essentially, they're being refinanced from what I can see. Yeah, um, and, and I was told that the government will dictate one of the large bank or asset management companies to come in and then basically provide a backstop to any of the um, default product. That's what I put under the conspiracy theory solution. Um, <laughs> the reality is that the new investors are all um, carefully looking at what they're investing in. Um, mm -hmm. But um, yeah, we are seeing refinancing. I am slightly suspicious that um, a comment I got from a bank recently was, Nobody wants to be the first to have a product fail, but once we've had one failure, then it will become normal and you'll see a lot more. <laughs> and I was a bit suspicious about, is he warning me not to buy any of his trust products, or is he, um, but I think we will start to see failures this year, um, because you can't keep bailing out, and the government has got to make examples, but none of the institutions wants to have the first product, because it's going to be a big reputational hit. Right. Um, so I think we're still in that phase of the big institutions trying to make sure they're covered and their reputations are clean, but sooner or later something is going to fail and the government is going to let it fail. So we had the first bond failure this year and there was a lot of noise about it because it's the first, but the second one I don't think we'll notice so much. And I think that's what's going to happen with trust products as well. Okay. So this, this government implicit refinancing process is going to disappear probably this year. Okay, thanks. Hmm. Yes. Siu Chin Lao from Heisen Development. Um, Simon and uh, Henry, you've given us a, a picture of what's going on in China right now uh, on the finance side and the real estate side. Presumably, I think China Chinese government will also notice all these problems. And on the regulatory side, uh, they must be thinking about something, uh, how to so deal with this situation. And yet, from the market point of view, we still, we still see a, a a lot of skepticism on the China's side. Is it a problem of what we don't believe, what they thought or what they said they're going to do, or what we, we are skeptical that they cannot do what they wanted to do? Or why still the market is so skeptical of what is uh, the situation in China and that is so pessimistic, pessimistic about what, 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 they, what we feel the situation is going to be? Um, I, I think, well, first of all, there's a lot of regulation coming out. Um, it is all based around improving risk management and um, selling processes um, in trusts and in banks. So, so the, I mean, the announcement this morning, well, over the weekend from CBRC was banks have to ring fence their wealth management products, manage them independently, and so forth. Um, but these are all, to my mind, regulations in reaction to the very rapid growth of the sector. Um, and the sector is outpaced and is continuing to outpace regulation. So the problem is that we're all very suspicious because we have no transparent information about all these products. We don't understand the risks of them. I mean, if you ever look through a trust product contract, by the way, it's kind of thin. Chinese law tends to be a bit like that. Um, and so everybody is very, very suspicious of the risks. And I think we're right to be suspicious because we can't see um, transparency in the sector. Um, we're also still very suspicious of the banks having huge amounts of bad loans, even though they are transparent. So even once the sector becomes more transparent, and it will come because I'm discussing with the regulators about how you can create transparency in shadow banking. Um, but I think it's going to be a long time before we're all satisfied um, about China because we're always very suspicious about China and statistics. Um, 
You know, it's just one of those things. So I don't think China has created a reputation for openness and transparency that will allow investors to have faith in things. So there's always that suspicion that things are being hidden, that things are much worse than they say, and that goes on. So I, I'm, I think it's going to continue. Um, but as I said, you know, if the only way you can find out about failed trust products is if there is an anecdote in the newspaper in China, it gives you a reason to understand that this is, first of all, it's a very, very private market. <coughs> Um, and as investors, we don't like that. We like to understand the risks of, of assets we're buying. Um, I think a lot of it is purely driven by speculation in the past from investors because they're just so dissatisfied with the low interest rates they got out of the banks. And with the very limited sources of investment in China, this has been a, a fantastically good way of suddenly getting real um, you know, value out of your investments. But you're doing so in, in a very difficult um, knowledge market, lack of knowledge about the risks. So it's speculation. Um, and now, whether we can manage a nice transition into into a good risk management and transparency, or whether we get collapse, is the question. Um, I was a bit worried at the end of the first quarter because the trust growth rates were dropping, and you're seeing a lot of movement into the bank's wealth management products, which are much simpler products. Um, I think that's eased off now. I think there's a lot less pressure. But um, as I say, if we want to finance seven and a half percent growth, the banks are not doing it. We have to continue. But it, it, yeah, there is not the transparency information you need as an international investor to make an investment, I think. Um, so knowledge of the market is just is too opaque. Um, and it is very worrying in that sense. I think if you look at, uh, you know, I always said uh, in the China shadow banking system is coming from the liquidity. There's so much money supply coming to the system. And then we see that recently, you know, over the past few years, the QTI quota has been increased, right? And also recently they're going to the QDLP. So they actually give the retail investors some chance to invest in overseas, you know, financial products, which is not going to contain within the Chinese system. That might be a one of the solutions of diverting those liquidity offshore. And then just to give you some from the from the real estate point of view, and then just give you some, some anecdotal stories. In 2012, the you know, Chinese are buying 130 billion of uh, the real estate in 130 million, sorry, 130 millions of real estate in the US, 2012. And 2013 is 260 million uh, uh, residential uh, transaction in the US. Just to give you the flavor, how much money has been flowing to the, to the offshore market as well. And also, we see some insurance monies offshore they're going to invest overseas for the real estate. That's purely from the real estate, real estate point of view. So they get more relax and relax, relaxation of the loans for those capital going offshore instead of within the Chinese system, which create a demand for the trust products. Hmm. Yes. Um, how far do you, uh, Conor O'Mara, Jeffries, how far do you think Tencent and Alibaba will be allowed to go within financial services? So. You, you mentioned how big, excuse me, <coughs> the, the money market fund has become. I'm, I'm sure you know Tiang Hong is now the largest money manager in China within 18 months. And it seems like that investor base fulfills two needs. First of all, on the consumer side, it's getting people who can't actually set up bank accounts because they don't have the minimum amount of money. And then another thing you were talking about was SMEs not getting financing. And that's where a lot of the demand seems to be coming from as well. People with Alipay accounts merchants actually getting financing. So it seems to have ful fulfilled two social needs, but obviously the banks hate this, as you mentioned. They've put pressure on PBOC, and now PBOC's beginning to react. So where do you think we're going to end up? Are Tencent and... Um, it, it's very easy. First of all, they have applied and been offered the chance to open banks. Um, so um, Tencent is working on an internet bank they're going to set up this year. Um, the, the great challenge they have is their big advantage is their knowledge of, of their IT, IT in China and the use of smartphone technology and their underlying payment platforms because they've automated the process. <coughs> so, you know, um, that's why they can deal with the very small investors because their, their transactional cost is tiny. But in order to keep that working and ensure that they don't have to create a banking credit skill, they reinvest into very simple money market. Um, but if they want to become a more of a service, suddenly they actually have to start making credit decisions and underwriting credit, and that's what they have to have the banking license for. Um, so whether they really want to become fully-fledged banks and actually you know, create um, credit underwriting divisions and so forth, I'm not sure. 
I think they just basically want to st keep it relatively automated in terms of, of the investment process and uh, uh, enable, um, as you say, financing of merchants on their, their site. So I think they're going to be a more of a niche player. I don't think they're going to try and challenge the banks in the banking market, but they need a banking license to expand what they're currently doing. Um, but I think you're right. They they spotted something that the banks have failed to spot, and I think it's just typical of banks. Banks are not great innovators. It's well known across the whole world. Um, but the ba the reaction of the banks to innovation has been to try and shut it down. But what they should be doing is saying, well, if they can do it, we can do a better product. But they're not. They go straight to the PPOC and say, this is unfair. <laughs> Um, and I can say it's, not, it's hardly unfair, they're just doing something very simple with technology. But banks aren't great innovators, so I'm, I'm encouraged to see that the government has said, yes, you can have banking licenses, you can continue to innovate. Uh, we need innovation in the financial sector in China. We have very simple but big banks, so we need innovation, and I think they will deliver it. Whether they start offering you know, retail mortgages and all that, I don't know. I'm not sure that's the route they're going to take. Um, that would require a lot of, of hiring of staff, and they're not doing that. So I think it's much more they're going to try and create technology banks rather than, than uh, sort of normal commercial banks. So sort of following up on that question, who is going to deal with the SME gap? I mean, Henry, you were saying also in real estate, you know, the large developers are, seem to be doing okay and the, the large investors, and that's sort of the takeaway I, I got from you, Simon, but what about the, the, uh, the well, SMEs? Well, there are some, I mean, just for example, Minsheng Bank, based out of Beijing, is, specializes in SME lending. Um, Citic also specializes in SME lending. Um, so certain of the banks reckon they have a strength in that area. Um, they don't get so much business from the big SOEs, so they're trying to do that. Um, the only thing is that they tend to have higher, much higher NPL rates, and they get criticised for that. But I say yes, but their 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 interest margins are better. So um, you know the risk and return ratios seem to bear out. But those institutions are not not big enough to finance half the economy. That's the, the issue yeah. to me. So that's why trust products are so popular. Um, and so the trust sector has just filled that gap, um, and very, very quickly. It's quite impressive about how fast it's happened. Um, yeah. Yes, Richard. Now you're t talking a lot about uh, uh, personnel who can do risk assessment and underwriting. What's happening on the training side? Are there going to are, are, are people coming down the pipes that are really can, can do it right? What's, what's happening on the educational side? Um, if you look at the big banks and the second tier banks, so the listed banks, which is about 12, I think, um, they have over the last 10 years, I mean, bear in mind in China we invented credit risk management just over 10 years ago. So it, it is incredibly good pace of change. Um, you know, I, I look at vast numbers of loans with my team in the banks we audit, thousands and thousands. And the discrepancy rates between our views and their views over time has decreased immensely. So they have trained um, people who are knowledgeable about lending in China, but it is mainly SOE lending from the big institutions. So I think what you're finding is Chinese bankers understand their market better than foreigners by a long way. Um, but the SME sector, which requires a different approach, which is much more based on um, a whole range of of understanding of business, because they don't have nice clean accounts in the SME market for you. you know. So your assessment has to be based on a whole range of other factors. Um, and this is where um, I think the banks are struggling a little bit. If you go to the US, for example, um, a lot of the P2P lenders think they're better at assessing SME and small retail credit than banks. And they use um, complicated algorithms based on all sorts of things off the, off the market to do so. Um, and in fact, there's a couple of P2Ps that are growing very strongly in the States because they don't think, and because American banks feel that they're not good at underwriting to SMEs either. So, I mean, Wells Fargo, for example, regards itself as one of the big SME lenders. Um, and they're being challenged by P2P lenders who say, yeah, but we use a much wider range of underwriting assessments. We're much quicker at originating loans. Um, and so I, I think. Training isn't the solution. The solution is actually to understand how you can use technology to be much more efficient. Because the uh, trouble with SME loans is they're small. And you know you can't spend thousands of dollars doing an underwriting assessment. Um, so you need technology to do that. But banks don't seem to be able to, anywhere in the world, don't seem to be able to drive that change in innovation. 
And so the, the fintech sector in, in the US is becoming very strong. And they're focusing on SMEs, small retail customers, you know, people trying to reorganize their credit cards, all that sort of stuff. And they do it automatically, no people involved. And a credit you know, assessment comes out and you're offered a loan within you know, 20 minutes. Um, I can't imagine a Chinese bank offering a loan within 20 minutes. Um, you know, two or three months is pretty normal. Um. Okay, we have time for one more couple questions, yes? Uh, hi there, Angus from uh, Jefferies. Uh, just a quick one, probably more for you, Simon. Um, outside of the uh, real estate sector in terms of pending defaults, is there any particular area of the market which you see at higher risk than others? I mean, resources, for instance, or? Yeah, definitely. Um, we're seeing um, an increased level of default. I mean, all the overcapacity industries in China, so steel, aluminium, um, and so forth, um, which is what you expect in, in, in the, the slowing growth of the economy. Um, Certainly, there's also uh, certain regions in the country. So um, there's particularly at the moment um, around the Pearl River Delta, a slowdown in growth. So that's affecting MPLs there. Um, again, also in wholesale and distribution, which is again. So basically, any sector which is affected by slowing growth is is coming out with, with new MPLs at the moment. Um, I don't think we're in a credit crisis in China. Would you, what we're just seeing is the effects of slightly slower growth transitioning into those industries which are most affected by slightly slower growth. Um, but just for example, petrochemicals, um, not a problem. Um, you know, we are you know, burning oil as fast as we can, driving our cars and all the rest of it. So, so certain sectors are very strong. Um, but other sectors are being hit by the slowdown. I think it, it, it reflects also where we had overinvestment um, in the past. So, for example, we had a lot of government-directed investment in the aluminium sector for a long time, um, and the same with copper. And so those, uh, that overinvestment is now you know, coming back to haunt us a little bit. So, um, you know, certainly you're seeing that. Um, I, so, yeah, it, it's, 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 it's just more normalizing economy, to be honest. Um, but I always say to people who ask me about, you know, where are all the NPLs in China, because there must be lots of bad debts, it says, um, if you have economic growth of over 5%, you create a lot of liquidity, and you don't have many bad debts. So we're still in, a, in an economy which is growing faster than anywhere else in the world as a major economy. Um, so the level of MPLs is not that worrying. But we haven't seen it before in the last you know, 10 or 15 years since we reformed and restructured the financial sector. Uh, but yeah, certain sectors um, have some bad results. Um, I mean, I look at all the industry types across the, the bank I order, and there's a whole range of MPLs. But just for example, mortgages. Residential property has pretty much the lowest MPL rate I see on the planet. You know, so as Henry said earlier, you know, Chinese investors in, in residential property tend to put in a very small amount of, of mortgage. It's mainly uh, mainly cash, and they're not defaulting. So, so you know, if, if I was a bank in China, I'd just lend on mortgages. It's probably the safest thing to do. Um, but it, it's it's still a you know, China is not a, a mature economy, and it's still very much government directed. So, sectors which are directed by the government to invest, and if the government then gets their, their demand wrong for the future, that's where the problems have started to emerge. Um, hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, no. Yet? I'm going to have to ask you because um, I we are we do keep to schedule, and Grab Richard's giving me the eyes. You can give take him um, afterwards, both of you. I didn't get to ask my question either, so sorry. <laughs> um, uh, before we before we um, bring as Charles comes up here, I do want to note that some of you might have blue badges, but that means that your company is a member of AmCham, but that doesn't mean that you are um, on the list. And we really do encourage you to. Um, become one of the, the named members of your of your company. Um, you can get so much out of AmCham beyond um, beyond this, these types of events, which are fabulous. And uh, we really encourage you to become more active in it. What you put in, you get out in spades. Um, and speaking of that, tonight there is the new member um, and we're monthly um, networking cocktail. So today's AmCham day for me because I get to host that one as well. Um, but. We have to thank our excellent guests today, our excellent speakers. Thank you for sharing your time with us. Thank you for sharing your insights and your expertise. Here's a small token of the AmCham's appreciation. Thank you, Henry. And I'm sure you promised to walk out slowly so everyone could still grab you, right? Can grab it. Okay. Thank you.